<laughs> All right, has everyone got a seat? Jess, you All want a seat? No, I Okay, oh. amen. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks, Pascal, for praying for my lesson. Woo. It means that I don't have to because you're a righteous man. Amen. <laughs> amen. The title of tonight's lesson is, What is True Repentance? Now, I was talking to my boss today as we were driving back from Whangarei. Because he knew that I was doing the lesson tonight. And he said, what's it on? And I said, oh, it's on repentance. There's a bit of silence in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I've got to be honest, I have no idea what that is. Oh. So we had a discussion on what repentance is. Mm. Wow. But the reality is, I think, you know, a lot of people don't really know what repentance is. And even religious people as well. Now, and a lot of, some people may know what it is, but that doesn't mean they put it into practice. Mm. They may know what evangelism is, but they don't do it. They may know what um, discipleship is, but they don't do it. They may say these things as optional. They, they uh, may know what confession is, but they may not do it. Mm. So we've got three points. First one is uh, God wants you to repent. When I was young, we lived in a, a big old farmhouse. It was pretty old and it was, it was not necessarily that well built, but it was home, you know. And, uh, and it had lots of places where you could where you could play. And um, I was very good at hiding. We used to play hide and seek. Well, I did it with my older brothers and sisters. So I'm six years younger than everyone else in my family, or at least six years younger. So um, I had this one place where I could hide. I could go into my wardrobe. I could climb up it, and I could hide in a cupboard at the top. Wow. And then put duvets and blankets over me, and no one ever knew where I was. <laughs> I was very, very good at hiding. Um, and sometimes I hid so long that people just gave up and stopped, and stopped playing the game. And I'll come to why that's important at the moment. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. God is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So what's the main point here? God doesn't want anyone to repent. Oh, so to perish, uh, not me. <laughs> oh. Okay, okay. <laughs> not, then, not me. Not the a, a murderer. Um, not not anyone. Okay, yeah. no matter what color they are, uh, if they're homeless, whatever. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Mm. Come on, Ian. The interesting thing about God is that we can't actually hide from God. Mm. That is my example. God sees us for who we are. Now that's quite incredible because I know that how I see myself, Sean doesn't see me the way I see me, okay? Mm. I see myself in a different way, but how I see myself doesn't necessarily mean that's reality, okay? Some of us can be negative about ourselves. Some can be overly confident about ourselves, okay? Um, God sees what is true and what is real. So God knows what we need to repent of. Yeah. We may not necessarily know. So that is what we need to, to work on. And God moves, manipulates, changes things in our lives to put us in situations and circumstances where we need to repent. And I think of a few people in this room, how we become Christians. I think of Sephora, French, got baptized here in Auckland. I mean, how many things must have happened in her life for her to be here, mm. all right, to get met, to become mm. a Christian? Margot and I, me from New Zealand, Margot from Australia, both got met in London. Lots of things that happened in our lives to take us to London. Mm. Okay? Now, um, God worked more in my life because I heard people preaching. I wasn't actually invited on the street. I heard people preaching on the train. I thought, yeah, these guys sound cool. I'll go to church. Wake up Sunday. No, I won't go to church. Okay? Um, God put a, a gentleman in my life. He was my supervisor at work who was a disciple. Wow. Okay? That's how much God had to work in my life. He knew how hard-hearted I was <laughs> to actually get me to church. And on the fifth time of saying, yeah, I'll be there on Sunday, I actually managed to make it. Wow. Margot, however, was a little bit more pure-hearted. She was invited once on a train on a Sunday morning and ended up at church an hour later. <laughs> okay? yes. A little bit difference there. But, but God wants everyone to repent, so he'll work in your life. Mm. And not just the moment that you become a disciple, but your whole life as well. Because repentance is a continual thing. Mm -hmm. So when we reject repenting, we're rejecting what God does in our lives for us. And in a way, we're rejecting God himself. Mm. Second part of God wants you to repent is that ignorance is no excuse. You know, you hear a lot with 
with sports people mm. that when they're caught for drug cheating, no one has any idea how they got drugs in their system. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Now, I think there might be a few people uh, where that is true. There's a, an Australian swimmer that's just been to the world champs and who got caught for drugs. She says she has no idea how those drugs got in her system. I don't know whether that's true or not. In fact, I think I can only ever think of one person yet yeah, said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I've, I've been caught out, yep, yeah, I've done the wrong thing. Only one person. Wow. Um, one one uh, Jamaican sprinter who, who just took the punishment and then decided to move forward without having to fight <laughs> it. But, you know, ignorance is no excuse. In Acts 17, verses 30 to 31, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this, of this to all men by raising him from the dead. You know, Paul's preaching in Athens to the uh, Oropagus here, to the people of the Oropagus here. Now, if you read this whole passage, and I suggest everyone does, you actually have a look. Their hearts do not want to repent. Mm. Because Paul, just after this, starts talking about... Um, raising the dead to life, the resurrection of the dead. And some people go, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, we want to hear more about that. Can you come back and tell us about that later? <laughs> his whole thing about his message of people need to repent, they didn't get that at all. No. They just wanted some intellectual <laughs> understanding of a new concept that they hadn't heard before. Ignorance is no excuse. Um, you know, I think... If you're like me, you know that deep down you need to continue to repent. Mm. You know that it's never going to stop. <laughs> that your life will always mess up somehow. You will always mess up. You will need to continually change. And, and if I, at some point, if I keep on pretending to myself, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to, then I'm in deep trouble. The ignorance of really of who I am and my struggles, I am at that point using it as an excuse not to repent. But the reality is, I always need to repent. Now you only have two choices. I love this, I think about two choices that you, you have in life. If you hear <laughs> statements, um, is, is it this or is it this? And ones I can think of is like, and you'll notice it's like Coke or Pepsi. Two choices. <laughs> That's it. That's all you have. Mm. Now, I don't know if it's in other countries, and it's more in Australia than any other country I know. Is it Ford or Holden? <laughs> That's it. Uh, gold or silver? What do you prefer in terms of jewellery? Uh, pets, cats or dogs? What do you like the most? Would you like tea or would you like a coffee? And one that we are often faced with um, on, a, on a daily basis do I text someone or do I call them? Mm. All right. We have two choices right there. Luke 13 verse 3. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Wow. So there are only two choices for us. Not just a one-time event, but there's only two choices. Either we repent or we will perish. Mm. If we are not living a repentant life, we are living a perishing life spiritually. Mm. But an analogy for this, I guess, is if you see something, if, if you don't repent, is um, fruit sometimes. Okay, And oranges are a great example. We've got this really nice orange tree in our backyard. And the oranges will fall off and they'll sit on the ground and I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll get them later. I'll get them later. And then they still look orange on the ground, but when I get closer and I pick them up, like your thumb goes through it. Yeah. All right? Still looks great on the outside, but from the inside it actually deteriorates mm -hmm. and that slowly works on the outside so from a distance it looks fine mm -hmm. but when you get close to it it's not fine and people were like that yeah. as well mm -hmm. from a distance when we go out sharing our faith we're talking to people and you might see a group of people and they're laughing and you're joking and it's easy in your heart to go oh i think they're fine they look they're happy right. to me but i know when i was at university i used to, to laugh a lot and have a lot of fun it was the best time of my life up until that point but the reality inside was something very, very different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone has to repent or they will perish. Well. Point number two. 
How can you tell if someone has repented? In Acts chapter 26, verses 19 to 20. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove repentance by their deeds. Yes, God demands that we prove our repentance by our deeds. You know, it's not that hard to see if someone has truly, truly repented. Yeah. But sometimes you do need to get to know them. You know, obviously there are, there are obvious ones. If someone is a smoker, they stop smoking. Okay, if someone swears a heck of a lot, you never ever hear a curse word that comes out of their mouth. The consequences of, of not doing this though, of not having the deeds, is that we will end up in hell. Wow. Mm. And I think of, I mean, all of us have repented at least once in our lives, okay? And I think of, and I know that um, Joe always used to tell the story in Sydney, and it was of Marari when she first yeah. came to Australia. <laughs> and she was, what, six months old as a Christian? You know, it's almost like Sephora, you know, going to another mission field after she's been a Christian for as long as she has. But Marari used to not like evangelism, okay? She used to dislike it intensely. Now, I can't think of anyone else and any other woman in this church that evangelizes as much as Marari. And in her heart wants to give and love people. Just incredible repentance in her life. But there are sometimes there are there are major events that we need to repent of as well. Um, I text a few people today uh, overseas and I ask, "Oh, can you tell me a story of of when you repented?" Mm. And, uh, um, that, and I've got uh, through these a few of these through the lesson. But I got one from sort of Hannah Paul over in Sydney, mm. our, our sister there. And when she became a Christian, she had a she had a relationship. We, she had a boyfriend, and and you talk to her. In all honesty, it was going pretty badly. But you still hang on to, to what you think gives you uh, comfort, what you think helps you. But she said the big thing that she had to repent of is really she had to, to in a sense, throw that boyfriend aside to become a Christian because that was actually stopping her from loving God. So you can tell if someone's repented not just by their uh, deeds, but by their attitudes mm. as well. You know, there's lots of attitudes that we can have. Positive. Yeah. Negative, mm. neutral, confident, jealous, courteous, respectful. That's not necessarily the they're not necessarily the attitudes of repentance. In terms of repentance, my favorite scripture is this one, and it's 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Mm. And leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation. What alarm. What longing. What concern. What readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent. In these matters. You know, you can tell repentance by someone's attitude. I think when you know that you need to repent, you know, need to change, you get a bit mopey. You get a bit down. You get a bit discouraged. You can see it in someone's face. You don't have to know what it is, what the sin is, but you know there's something wrong. They need to repent. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this attitude that it's talking <coughs> about here, it's the complete opposite of that. It's light and light and uh, darkness, day and night. Simply saying sorry is not repentance. Mm -hmm. Neither is confessing repentance. Yes, it's a step, but it's not repentance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, confessing is like a spiritual sorrow. Okay. But you can, you can confess and you, you'll feel good when you confess. And I think after Sunday, we all feel, felt good. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's not repenting. And unless we mm -hmm. actually repent, yeah. we'll go back to feeling how we did 
on Saturday mm -hmm. or on Friday mm -hmm. or on Thursday. Yeah. This um, verse really talks about the attitude of, of, that we need when we actually do it. So earnestness, sincerity. We're eager to repent as opposed to to being pushed by someone and it's always great to you know get together and confess sins but I did sort of so when I was thinking about this lesson I did have a sort of a little bit of a pit in my stomach Sean Hatt shouldn't have to ask me to confess my sin it, it should happen as part of my natural life mm -hmm. my daily life so if we as a group as brothers if we get together to confess sins and I haven't confessed those sins before the error is with me. Mm -hmm. I am not having godly sorrow towards my sin. Mm -hmm. Indignant, anger, alarm. Just an understanding that we're, we're being lukewarm. Yeah. We're ready to be right with God no matter what the cost mm -hmm. or the inconvenience. So what does it, move, uh, what does it mean to, be proved, to have proved yourselves at every point? That there's no doubt in your mind... Or in anyone else's mind that yes you have repented of your sin simply put Jesus says and so you're willing to do it because if Jesus is telling you to do it we'd better do it so what's examples of, of good attitudes um, I think that uh, there's a couple I've got here when when Margot and I were in Brisbane and we hadn't been going to church much we sort of gave ourselves like 12 months to, to find out what we we're going to do. So we were going to different churches and, and uh, figuring out what to do. And then we decided that we'd go to, to Joe and Kerry's house church. And then once we'd been doing that for a while, um, we decided, okay, we're going we're to start a church. So we booked a venue. Okay, we're going to start evangelizing people. So every Saturday for hours, we'd drag our kids out to go evangelizing on Saturday. And then we decided, okay, we're going to have a, a Bible discussion in the house. So Joe came over and we knocked on like 50 houses in our neighborhood, just inviting everyone along to our, our Bible talk. Another example in terms of attitude, I was talking to a brother um, who now leads a church. And he was saying that um, a, a while ago, and I don't know how long ago, but quite a while ago, he was really struggling with, with pornography. And it's, it's really hard when you've got a phone. We all know it's very easy to, you know, look here and look there and, 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 and decide, you know, I guess get tempted. Mm -hmm. But he's saying he just got rid of that phone. He bought a brick phone, not a smartphone at all, mm -hmm. so he could just text and call people. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So that, that real attitude, no, I'm, I'm just going to completely throw it away and start again. Yeah. So just how radical do we have to be with sin? Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 43. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into a sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. So I always have to ask yourself, and you need to ask yourself as well, how radical am I with the sin that is in my life? Mm. You know, when was the last time that I had that attitude? Mate, I'd rather have my hands cut off than cause this sin again. Wow. You know, what? that sin can be anything. It can be um, from a relationship. It can be from a friend. It can be from family. It can be uh, uh, your job causing you to sin. You're spending so much time at your job that you get more satisfaction out of that. If those are the causes of our sin, we need to cut them off. We need to be radical in how we treat it and how we deal with it. Otherwise, the other example, what happens is that we do not end up in heaven. We do not end up with a relationship with God. We end up going to hell. You know, examples of, of radical. I mean, I, I don't know many people more radical than Chris, to be honest. Oh, Chris. Um, Chris, Chris. Chris told me today that when he was younger, you know, we all know he said he had a bit of a tough time at home and, and uh, he would get bitter. He would get angry. He would get frustrated. And he wouldn't share. He wouldn't sort of talk about 
these struggles with any of his family members. But right now, I, I can safely say that, that Chris generally says what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, doesn't want those heart, he doesn't want those things to build up in his heart and to cause him to sin. Now, the fourth part of this is living for righteousness, not simply dying to sin. You know, and, and, and the scripture that we know so well that really, really fits into this, uh, and it's not on this list, is 1 Timothy 4.16. Okay, life and doctrine. Okay, if you want, um, dying to sin is like the doctrine. But then living for righteousness is the life that yeah. we need to have as well. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Mm -hmm. By his wounds you have been healed. You know, some Christian groups teach uh, to die to sin, things like no sex before marriage, you know, no drugs, no smoking, no drunkenness, no swearing, um, no hatred, no unforgiveness. Um, but they, what they don't teach is how to live righteously. Yeah. They tell you how to not live unrighteously, but they don't tell you how to live righteously. That's true. So in a sense, that this isn't repentance, okay? It's just half the, so, it's half the side of a coin. So we also need to live righteously and do the things that God wants us to do. Share our faith. Love people. Study the Bible with people. Help people to become Christians. Give our money to missions so that people have the chance to be saved. Yeah. Build up churches to help serve the poor, serve other people. Not just coming to church, but having an active involvement in the church as it grows. Jesus was a leader, so we must also be a leader as well. <laughs> and preaching another doctrine out there. <laughs> You know, and I think, you know, what, what people um, really e exemplify this mm -hmm. in terms of, of living righteously mm -hmm. and doing what we need to do. Come on, Ian. In 1 John chapter 2, 3 to, uh, 3 to 6, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word... Love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now an example I always think of, you know, who really personifies this? And I, I struggle to go past someone like Beric. Mm -hmm. Okay? Really personifies this. Talk to everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. Share their faith. Okay? In a line at a bank. Out mm -hmm. evangelizing. Wherever. Homeless. Just really giving your heart to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other person in my life, the person I'm very grateful for, was the person that met me. Um, his name was Lolu. Lolu Oceanby. Wow. He was an uh, English Nigerian. Wow. And um, he, he was quite phenomenal. When I started work, and my team was quite small. I worked in a training department. And there was maybe eight of us. And there was one guy in there, Richard. Uh, he was an English guy. Very funny. Very, very funny guy. But I'd only been working there like one day and Richard came up to me and, and uh, so, so Lola was a disciple and uh, Richard came up to me and said, has Lolu talked to you yet? Oh. <laughs> and I was like, no, what do you mean? He's, and he was like, don't worry, you'll know. <laughs> you know, Lolu talked to everyone, okay? Wow. Every single person, not just in our department, but like on our whole floor. Wow. Seemed to know that Lolu was a disciple. Wow. And coming into work, he would talk to someone on the train every day. Going home, uh, he, would, he would talk to someone on the train. And the year that he met me, he was actually fruitful four times wow. with people. Um, and, and even people as hard-hearted as me, he, he won over because that was just his lifestyle. Mm. Point three, the rewards for repentance. Now, this is the good stuff, so you can relax hey. now, okay? <laughs> you know, we all like rewards. Kids like rewards. Yep. Uh, my daughter still likes rewards. Yep. Amen. <laughs> Both of them. Um, you know, they are, I guess, in a sense, they are a great, a great motivator. But sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget the rewards of repentance. Mm. 
they sort of escaped me. And the, the obstacles to repent seem greater than the reward. And in the reality, it's not like that yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. In Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. What happens when you repent according to this, reverse, this verse? Times of refreshing. Mm -hmm. And who doesn't want to be refreshed? Mm -hmm. All of us want to be refreshed. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, when you're a university student and when you're working, life can get tough at times. Okay? It can get really tough. And I remember when I was an intern working for the church, going out and sharing your faith for five or six hours. Life can be pretty tough sometimes. Okay? Mm -hmm. We can get emotional. So times are refreshing. We all need times of refreshing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, repentance is never a bad thing to do. It's not something to be feared, but sometimes we can. So why don't we want to repent? You know, being in the state of repentance, not dealing with the sin, feeling permanently guilty or in pain or frustrated, that's really hurtful to us. Mm. And we go back to that first verse, God wants everyone to repent. Mm. And if we don't, we won't make it to the end. So repentance isn't an event. It's a lifestyle. We hear that a lot, don't we? A lifestyle choice. But repentance for us as Christians is a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we repent, there is lightness, refreshment, and joy. Mm. Um, I was uh, a couple of people who have been part of the, the Sydney church I was also talking to. I was talking to Natalie, Aww. and um, Natalie came with the mission team, her and her husband, Mason. Actually, they were actually the first couple that were supposed to lead the church in Auckland. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that was it. That's why they came to Australia, so they could lead it, lead it here. Uh, obviously, yeah. as we talked about, God had another plan. Yeah. That plan went out the window years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But Natalie was talking to me, now they lead the church in San Diego. And she said, that, you know, um, that there's when... The church meets for midweeks, and uh, they have split meet midweeks, men and women down there. Um, and she was really struggling at midweeks. There's, the, there's some mature women down there, and there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of problems. There's been, there'd been a lot of struggles. So she would come in, she said she would preach, and she would just feel that she couldn't connect. That she wasn't preaching powerfully and help, helping people to repent. So then she would go home, and she'd be some, some Wednesday, she'd be in tears. But she felt that she's really being effective in, in a woman's ministry. So she got, you know, lots of advice, talked to lots of people. So she decided that, that she needed to repent. She needed to change and she needed to get her lead women that worked with her to do it as well. So she actually bought, got them to buy into them really taking responsibility of their groups mm -hmm. so that the whole burden wouldn't fall on Natalie. And so that Natalie said she, she changed her her preaching style, so she was a lot more confident, a lot more positive, a lot more trusting in God. And she said that the final result of that is that one of the interns in the church there, one of her mothers, is going to get baptized this weekend wow. down in San Diego, which is a great victory for the church. So, but also, repentance brings salvation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, <laughs> Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to P Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord sees will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You know, here the listeners to Peter's sermon, unlike the listeners to Paul's sermon that we talked about earlier in Greece, the people here were cut to the heart. What does it mean to be cut to the heart? Look, I, I don't exactly know, but I, I was thinking... You know, there's probably no deeper wound yeah. than being cut to the heart. Wow. You can be stabbed in any other place and you might survive. But if you're stabbed in the heart, 
you're not going to survive. There is no deeper wound than that. So, how can you tell if someone is cut to the heart when their sin is made obvious to them? Well, I think the first thing they, they do is they don't get defensive. And they ask, like the people did here, what do I need to do to change? Then you know, hey, the message really sunk in. And then when they hear that, they respond to that, just like the people did here, by getting baptised. But the interesting thing about this verse is that if they hadn't repented, their baptism was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Their baptism would not have saved them, and they would have been living in a false hope, in a false existence, if they hadn't repented before they went through that. You know, Sunday was a great time, a, a time of confessing. I haven't really talked to much of the women about what happened. I know it must have been good because they took quite a while. Uh, but that happens, that's just natural, that, that's life. Um, but what's happened in your life since then? Mm. Do you feel that you have repented from your sin that you talked about? Mm. Or is it still just hanging around the edges, waiting to take hold of your heart again? Mm. Now, someone we talk about in the church a lot is Emmanuel. Come on, you know. Okay? Um, if you haven't met him, you will meet him soon uh, at the conference. Mm. But before there was Emmanuel, there was Brian. Aww. Now Brian was, uh, I say that because Brian came, and came from America and met Emmanuel. Yeah. Yeah. Emmanuel would not have been a disciple if it wasn't for Brian. Yeah. And uh, Brian was telling me he was, uh, Brian loves, loves Australia, okay? And I know in his heart he wants to come back. In the moment he lives back in the, in the States. But he was telling me, that he, he leads a Bible discussion, a, a Bible talk, and um, something like 18 people or something go to it each Friday. So it's quite a big group. Wow. But he was saying that, that over a period of time, he, he, could, he could see, or looking back, he could see that his heart was getting harder. He was getting less and less advice on how his Bible talk was going. He was traveling overseas without even telling his evangelist that he was going off on a holiday or, or a work event or whatever. He was getting to a point where he felt he knew better than the people that were leading his, his region in the church. And then when he was confronted with all of his sins, he said he, he broke down and he wept. Because it wasn't until someone actually confronted him could he actually see uh, that he needed to repent, that his heart had got so hard. So then they, they, talk, they talked a lot more um, about the situation and he started to, ch he changed. He got advice, mm. okay, he got advice on, on everything he was saying, um, especially on how to lead in his Bible talk. And as soon as he did that, his Bible talk went from being ineffective to the next Friday having nine visitors mm. at his Bible talk. So you can see how repentance yeah. really is refreshing <laughs> yeah. to our lives and to our hearts. Okay. Um, finally, Come on. a biblical conversion brings repentance and peace, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. followed by the power of the Spirit clearly working in people's lives. Mm -hmm. and, and I can really see that in, in some people in the church. And, and my final two examples, just in terms of the Spirit clearly working in someone's life, I think, first of all, is Pascal. Oh, yeah. um, you know, uh, and I shared this at Good News, I think, after uh, we've been out sharing. I went out sharing with him last week, and I was just blown away by his boldness. Was it, is it um, I just had to go to the bathroom. We walked into the, the, uh, the room, the toilets at the end there, and he just walked straight up to three people and invited them all along, wow. you know, to, to church. And I was thinking, you know, did I ever do that when I was three months old as a Christian? No, not at all. So just mm -hmm. his boldness is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I also think of, of the, the power of spirit really working strongly in Isabel's life as well. Mm -hmm. And just after the communion that, that she shared mm -hmm. um, when she was at the Ignite service, just how far she had come, and in a sense just where her heart was, to how her heart has changed. Yeah. And, that, and she is now living for righteousness. Oh, and, and it hasn't just brought times for refreshing for her, but for the whole family as well. <laughs> so in conclusion, what is, what is true repentance? We're going to remember 
God wants us to repent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to. How can you tell if someone has repented? Um, radical change, godly sorrow, and a radical attitude towards sin and repentance. Mm. And what are the rewards of repentance? Refreshment and salvation. Mm. So you could say that repentance, there is no other way. Yeah. Amen. Yeah.